Hello, and welcome to Learning Music with Pat. Today I've decided to spend the entire episode on George Frederick Handel. He is the composer who wrote The Messiah, and I want to go into his life and how he wrote and what he accomplished, and then I want to play for you the Alleluia Chorus from Handel's Messiah. And I want to discuss a little bit about the, the production, The Messiah, first and give you a little bit of information. My twin sister will be playing the organ. She she has a Hamilton a tracker organ, which she's going to be playing in the background. I have it recorded. So first, let's talk a little about the Messiah as a musical piece, as a musical presentation. So we'll look at the charts over here. The Messiah was written by George Frederick Handel. And this is an oratorio, which is somewhat like an opera. The difference is this. In an opera, you have people singing, sometimes solos, sometimes duets, sometimes a whole group of people singing, and then they're acting all of their presentations out on stage. They have an orchestral background. But in an oratorio, you have people singing their parts, but there's no acting, there's no props, there's nothing being acted out on stage. Instead, you have an orchestra, you have the choir of various sizes. Originally, the Messiah was written for just about 12 to 24 singers. It wasn't meant to be sung by the massive choirs that sing it today. I've sung in choirs. I used to do the Messiah every year, and we had approximately 200 people in the choir. That's not really what it was written for, but it sounds beautiful either way. And the orchestra is usually small. Now, in an opera, uh, you can have a full-scale orchestra. In the oratorio, you have the orchestra, you have the singers, but they maintain their position. They don't walk around. They don't use props. So it is a musical, prep, uh, a musical presentation in which you see the orchestra, and you see the singers sing, and you hear it, but there's no action on stage other than where they're sitting. So uh, it's an oratorio, and I guess I've discussed that. No props like you would get in a, in a regular uh, opera. Let me turn this page, if I can get it. Well, we'll skip that one. I'll go to the next one. This is a part of the Messiah as he originally scored it. You know, it's, it's very difficult to read. I've known people who write uh, similar to that. It's very hard to read it. Now we have a regular score. I'm going to show it to you. Uh, just the score of the Messiah. This is a book that has a, the Messiah in it, and um, it's uh, it's quite complicated, as you see. I'm going to show you a poster in a minute. The Messiah has 53 pieces in it, and uh, the uh, orchestra is playing all of them. The choir is singing most of them, but not all of them. And uh, so that's 53 pieces. Now, the 44th piece is the Alleluia Chorus, which is the most, uh, what most people are familiar with. But also, you know, uh, For Unto Us a Child is Given. A lot of people listen to that. That's beautiful. I like it. And, of course, in the end, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain, which is the last piece. Number 44 is the Alleluia Chorus. It actually should be called Chorus Alleluia because he has the choruses and then they are numbered, so it's really chorus hallelujah, not that that makes that much difference. And uh, it, it comes toward the end of the second part. There are really three parts of the oratorio. Most people are familiar with the Easter part and the Christmas part. That's what they hear. It takes about two, two and a half hours to do the whole presentation. And, uh, but, but the, you know, there's an intermission, sometimes two intermissions in it, but it is fairly long. When I used to be in it every year, we used to rehearse all day, and then we would present the Messiah at night, which used to be about two hours and 15 minutes, because there was usually a, like a 15 minute or so inter uh, intermission. And sometimes when you see a, a, a presentation of the Messiah, they do the whole thing. They don't just limit themselves to the Easter part, or to the Christmas part. They do the whole thing, but they leave some music out of it because of its length, so they choose the pieces that people will like the best and the pieces that were most appropriate to whatever season is showing it. 
Now, he wrote this in 24 days, and that was amazing because to do it, it has four parts to it. To do four-part harmonies and to write it in 24 days is just an amazing feat. At the time, however, he was very, very depressed. And the Alleluia Chorus, when he read that, when he wrote that, it seemed to take him out of his depression, and he wasn't depressed after that. But when he wrote it, he spent all of his time in his cottage his room, wherever he was. He didn't go out. People brought in food, and he wrote day and night. It was feverish. But when you hear it, you can understand why it would be so complicated. He wrote it in four parts. You have the soprano, the alto, the tenor, and the bass. He really wanted to write it in more parts than that, because you see you have contraltos, you have baritones, you know, four parts as usual, but there's more than four parts to the human voice if you go go into what the ranges are. But he only stuck with the four parts because he was afraid that most people wouldn't be able to understand it if it got more complicated. Now, this music is complicated. There's no doubt about that. But he didn't look at it that way. He looked at four parts as being simple. And so he wrote it in four parts. But I'm glad he did because it's complicated enough. If you listen to the whole thing and listen to the four parts, try to listen to it all as it's being done together. It's just an amazing piece of music. It's just something that you can't believe that human beings would be able to orchestrate it. Now, I also want to mention that the whole, uh, the whole thing is scriptural. All of the words of the, of the Messiah, from beginning to end, they're all scriptural. They come directly from the scripture. And so it really is a, 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 a a presentation of what the Bible says about his birth, about his life, about his death, about his resurrection, about salvation. It's all of that. And so it's interesting to go to a presentation. I think people should go every so often just to see what it's like to have an oratorio, full-scale oratorio, orchestra, massive chorus, depending upon how many people you get to sing in it. Usually it's quite a few that want to. It is kind of a cool to be able to sing the Messiah and uh, to be able to go through all of that and it's amazing experience both for the musicians and it's also an amazing experience for the audience who listens to it and usually when you play the Alleluia chorus everybody stands up the story was that he played it in England it was first performed in Dublin Ireland but when he played it in England when it was performed in England it was before performed before King George and whoever else was there for the audience and when he heard the Alleluia Chorus, he was so moved by it that he just stood right up, and he stood up through most of the presentation of it. So now it's a tradition that a lot of people, as soon as they hear those beginning strains of the Alleluia Chorus, they automatically just stand up for it, and it, it can be anywhere, depending upon the arrangement that you're listening to, anywhere from four to six minutes long to play the whole thing. Now, I want to talk to you about, um, well, let me show you this first. Four parts. This comes from the score. I have a score here that I just showed you, and this is just one page of the score, and I want to point something out to you uh, while I have a chance to do it. These are four parts, three trebles, one bass, and then these two right here, the treble and bass is a piano part. So all through this particular score, there's a piano part running, and you can play it to the piano part. Now, there are various versions of it. This is a, a Sherma score, and uh, you can see the four parts and then the piano, four parts and then the piano. And the score is actually, just for the Alleluia Chorus, it's 11 pages long. So I brought this in. I'll just put it right here. Well, let me just stick it here. I don't think, I'm not trying to, I'm not expecting that the camera people will be able to zero in on any one particular part, but if you can kind of scan through and see how that 11 pages is. It's very, very, thank you, that's perfect. Uh, that's, that's what it's like, the whole 11 pages. I photocopied it right from the Sherma score. Now, uh, it, it's 11 pages long, but you see, and I'm gonna put this down now that you've had a chance to see that. 
you can see that there's really only three melody lines, two to three melody lines on a page, because say you have, this is your melody right here, you've got these three parts with it, plus the piano score. So you have a good deal of space that's taken up just by even one line of the music. It is incredible. It's an incredible piece. Now I want to talk a little bit before I play it about the organ. My sister will be playing the organ. You'll hear it in the background. We've recorded it and uh, we do it at concerts like this. This is a piano or actually an organ version of the Alleluia. And this is a pipe organ she's using. The pipe organ is, is not one of these electrified, digitized, uh, you know, little keyboards that happens to have an organ setting to it. This is a full scale, massive, true pipe organ. It is the Hamill Tracker Pipe. And uh, it was made in Massachusetts. It is built in 1885. That makes it now 129 years old. It is very old. There are over 600 functioning pipes. Now, if you want to do an octave, if my sister wants to do an octave to go from one note to another note, she activates 52 pipes, 52 pipes for one octave. Now, you know what an octave is. It's a scale of eight notes, and the, and the last note replicates what the first note was, either up or down. But there are 600 pipes, 52 pipes used for an octave. There are 18 stops to this instrument. That's nine stops on either side, which she pulls out to get certain kinds of sounds. And there is a room on the floor below where the organ is that's called the chest. Now the chest room contains an electrified blower. Uh, and this is the only thing that's electric in this organ is the blower. And it was done so that people wouldn't have to pump and push air into the organ for her to play it. Years ago, before the blowers were electrified, people used to actually have to stay in a room and pump air into the pipes so the organist could play. This is how old this organ is. But now it has an electrified blower so that uh, all she has to do is turn it off. On. There's a power switch, and then the blower will take effect, and then she can play whatever she wants. There are actually two keyboards to this organ, an upper and a lower, which she can play at the same time if she wants to. There's a set of foot pedals so that she can play a whole scale on the foot pedals just by using her feet. So you've got 600 pipes, you've got 18 stops, you've got two keyboards, you've got a whole Whole, uh, whole area where there are pipes on the floor so she can play with her, with her uh, feet. And you can get tremendous volume out of it. Very old, this is a classic organ, just a wonderful organ. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to play the Alleluia Chorus. I'm using a recorder. This is the music that I'm going to be doing it from because I have my own copy of it. And uh, it, it is a bit of a stretch for a recorder, but we'll try it. I'm not saying it's going to be perfect, but we'll try it. And as I say, we do this in concerts and so forth. There's no introduction to this. This is kind of like a practice tape. There's no introduction. Normally you have, and when we do concerts, you will play like a three measure introduction and we don't have that here so when it starts to play I've just got to kind of join in so there's no preparation for that so we will go ahead and play chorus alleluia
is. There were a couple of little squeaks in it, but other than that, it was okay. It's very hard to play it on a recorder anyway, but that's a chorus hallelujah. Now, if you just imagine when you have the whole, whole assembly of an orchestra there and a massive choir and everybody's playing it, it is a magnificent piece, probably the most popular piece of the hallelujah chorus. Now, I want to talk a little about um, about uh, Frederick Handel, George Frederick Handel. I won't have too much time because we're almost out of time. But he was born in Germany. His father was a businessman and he wanted him to be a lawyer. But his mother was a daughter of a Lutheran pastor. And his father worked for the court. And when the court recognized his talent because he was playing as a young child, they suggested that he have special music lessons because he was very gifted. And he learned. He had one teacher. Zakow was his only teacher and he learned organ harpsichord, violin, oboe, harmony, counterpoint, choral writing, and orchestration. And at age 11, he wrote his first composition. He eventually moved to Florence, Italy. He loved opera. He fell in love with opera. He wrote about 40 of them. So he has a long, prestigious career. He was very friendly. He was people-oriented. He loved people. He had wore a huge white wig all the time. He had huge hands and huge arms and huge feet, you know, and people got to recognize him. He became very famous, but he was also sensitive. He was also uh, depressed. He had an, a depressive personality as well, so he would swing back and forth. I often think he had a cyclic kind of disorder, but at any rate, uh, he was just a monumental composer and has written many, many wonderful works, and he uh, got out of his depression with the Alleluia Chorus, and uh, he continues, and he continued to write other kinds of music. Most of it has been lost. Most of what we know about him is from the Messiah, but he did write a lot of other music. So I'm going to close it here because we're almost out of time. I wish I had a little more time, but I don't. So we'll close it here, and we'll go on to something next time. Please join me then.